Um, so it's just a short question rather than a speech like everybody else. Um, <laughs> will existing free schools be safe and properly funded if your party forms the next government? No. No. <laughs> right, we'll start with you. Bear in mind, there's a free school in Mill Hill. I know, I know, there's a free school in Mill Hill. I think there's, um, given, the, given the pressure that we have on primary school places and indeed also secondary school places in lots of London, I, I would not be advocating any, you know, any school being closed down for any reason whatsoever. I mean, my, my issue with the way that the government originally legislated, this is the previous part of the fire in 2015, on, on free schools was simply that they stopped local authorities opening up new schools. And whilst it's absolutely right that people want the aspiration to set up their own new schools, that, and I know, know you've done it, and you're absolutely triggered it, what's happening at this time, it's very clear to me, and I experienced this myself when I was a, a councillor, that sometimes a, lo it's a local authority is the only agency that can actually, make, that can actually fill a gap when there's a demand for primary school places and there's nobody willing to step in. There aren't a group of parents that have the social capital in the agency to set up a free school. There aren't the, there aren't the, there aren't the institutions. Um, to partner a partner and form an academy. So from that perspective, I always think that in terms of mission, getting the missions right, it's important that, a, that we have you know local authorities, schools sitting alongside free schools, academies, but close them. No. Okay, Matthew. Simply no. I'm very proud that I've worked with Adam to establish the first one of the first 16 free schools in this area at Exine. I'm very proud to be working also with the parents of Wallen Community School, the Marco Polo, and indeed the second uh, free school for the Jewish community with Eve Sachs. Uh, schools in, uh, have actually improved their standards. They're better than ever before. Nine out of 10 schools are good at understanding. That's up from two, two thirds of 2010. But briefly, let's talk about the budgets. The, there is a record amount of money going into schools. The issue is there are more and more pupils. So we will put that additional money in. That's something I've been lobbying the government for. We will make it happen. We know the trade unions and we know the Labour Party's view on free schools and might we'll once again be in our minority. Okay, anyone else want to come in on this? Yeah, Go ahead. Absolutely, certainly. Um, look, I mean, at the coalition government, we, 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 we set up the, the instruments to allow free schools to set up. And I think where there is the demands, you know, I think it was good that we, we, we actually set those up because, you know, we do have struggling school spaces. I know that's a teacher myself. And if we can have free schools to, 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 uh, to ease that, then that's good. Um, but as Mike correctly identifies, there are sometimes, there's a need for schools in places where perhaps there isn't people, there are no people to set up free schools. And therefore, we do need to allow local authorities to set up schools as well as free schools. But yes, I definitely would not, would not consider any sort of closure of schools at the moment because we desperately need them. Um, and to bring uh, up uh, the point about funding, uh, you know, funding may have been the highest ever, and you say, uh, Matthew, of course, that, that the pupils are are more than ever, but because the per pupil funding, and this is the National Audit Office, the government's own checkers, have said that there's a three billion pound shortfall. And I can feel that personally in my job, where we are expected to make a 1.6, 1.8 billion pound uh, savings through, um, through, through, uh, through non-procurement savings. Well, to me, that means teacher cuts, and we cannot have that at all in our growing population. I'll just add very quickly that um, definitely um, the Green Party um, will promote free schools and um, in particular uh, free schools to be brought into the local authority system so that there's, there's support and there's financial support for the free schools. As a man to go at schools, uh, it's now it's up to year two is free school, but our, our party we will continue with free school up to year six. Okay, thank you. Uh, Ariella Lister has a question with regard to Trident. Yeah, have Trump control the button. Um, in view of the fact that terrorism is now a um, fact of life in Britain, which of you <coughs> would vote to scrap Trident and use that money for more surveillance on terrorist sympathisers? and more undercover agents to infiltrate terror cells. The question is simply, rather than putting money towards Trident to perhaps concentrate on more immediate concerns relating in particular to terrorism and infiltrating terrorist cells to secure our country. Go ahead. Yes, in fact, that is in the Green Party manifesto. We do want to scrap Trident completely. It's called a nuclear deterrent. 
But if we're the first ones to push the button, we, that's not a deterrent. If we're the second ones to push the button, it didn't serve as a deterrent either. And that's costing us, what, 200 billion up to 2020? And that's an incredible waste of, of money. And as you say, intelligence is not the nuclear, I've tried it, it's not nuclear, it's not intelligence. What we need to counter terrorism is intelligence. We need the increase in police force. Policing is not just the cops on the streets. Policing is the intelligence, all the counterintelligence, much better, much better interconnectivity with Interpol, CIA, etc., and, and all the different agencies. And this is what we're lacking right now because there have been so many cuts. Austerity has hit everything, and we've got, the Green Party is going to make sure that the intelligence and the counterintelligence is there to protect us and keep us secure. Thank you. Would anyone else like to comment? Yes, yeah, certainly. Yeah, certainly. Um, in, in the past, I've been on the record of, of, of wanting to, uh, to, to scrap uh, tries, and I do think, you know, born into the RAF, you know, I, I would like to see that money go to much better uh, conventional uh, military defence, or indeed to counter terrorism. Um, but I, I'll have to be truthful, you know, the world has changed uh, in the last few years. We've seen increased uh, aggression uh, from Russia in the Middle East and, of course, in Eastern Europe. And I think at this stage, going for complete unilateral you know, disarmament wouldn't, uh, wouldn't be wise uh, on the global scale. It would be irresponsible to do that. Um, but there is uh, alternatives to funding for counterterrorism. I think, absolutely, we, we do need the money. We need, first of all, better policing, uh, better funding for policing so that we don't have people uh, taken away from the sort of community-facing side of, of policing uh, um, because they need it elsewhere. Uh, we do need to ensure that that, that is uh, targeted because getting into the community uh, is the best way to stop people becoming uh, radicalized in the future. Thank you. Uh, I want to hold this question because our manifesto has not been released. So I will, I'm asking you that, you know, uh, to, I will speak later on Okay, thank you. Yeah, First of all, we usually Liberal Democrats changing their minds at elections. But what I would say, no, we want tried. And we need tried it. And, and I can explain simply why. And that's because of Russian aggression, the threats from North Korea as they are continuing to have missile tests. Uh, and most of all, ISIS. ISIS ever get hold of a nuclear weapon, it would be the only way for us to defend ourselves. But we have tried it because it's kept us safe since we have had it. We have not had a nuclear war because people recognize that we can defend ourselves. Now, Jeremy Corbyn's, his party wants to keep trying, he doesn't. He said he'd like to keep the submarines going around the world, but he'd never actually use the button. That's ridiculous, that's a complete waste of time. We're gonna increase the money uh, in, that we spend on defense, and we're also going to look at the spending we have on our security service. It's not an either or, we need both. Thank you. Right. Very quickly, uh, Ariel, I, I think actually, as uh, Matthew just said, it's not an either or. We have to we have to spend more. La Labour and government, I believe, consistently is, you know, spent at or above the NATO two percent uh, bench two percent of GDP benchmark <laughs> on, on defence. We only need to make sure that returns. I'm a multilateralist. I want to see the end of nuclear weapons, but we can't do it in a unilateralist way. So I believe that uh, I, I believe in keeping Trident as part of the deterrent. But absolutely, we need to develop those other forms of. Uh, defence against particularly cyber terrorism to make sure that all our, you know, we have proper fit for purpose defence capabilities and that means we need to return to 2% plus defence. <coughs> okay, thank you. Uh, Mark Berenson has a question with regard to smoking at the entrance of the Mill Hill station. Good evening. Each morning, as I approach the entrance to the station, I am required to walk through a haze of cigarette smoke, which as a non-smoker, I find quite unpalatable. What, are the candidate, what do the candidates propose to do to address this unhealthy and revolting situation? I think we'll refer that question in the first instance to the Green Party. <laughs> well, um, actually in public spaces, there is supposed to be no smoking, so if there isn't a no smoking sign, the first thing I would do is put one up there because it's obviously a public space. People are going there every day. And we all know that secondary um, passive smoking also kills. So definitely we need to do, we tackle, we do something about that. And all other public spaces as well, for that matter. Mike? 
Um, yeah, that doesn't sound very nice at all. I mean, I think what you need to do sometimes as a local MP is just get and bang people's heads together. So I mean, with, with the help of local of the local councillors, you know, sit down with the train with the train operator and actually ask them to find a way they can have a smoking shelter that's to the side and doesn't block <coughs> up the access to the uh, the access to the stairs. I mean, in the long run, and I heard this at the neighbourhood forum, there are some quite ambitious plans for much stronger, bigger developments of the of the station, and uh, I think I'd be very supportive of that. In the short term, you just kind of go and get in there and roll your sleeves up and do some hard work to try and solve the problem. Matthew? Well, first of all, I would suggest to Mark that you should be more worried about the air quality there than you should smoke it because it's one of the worst in London. Um, mm -hmm. First, secondly, um, having worked with John Gillett on a neighbourhood forum, I brought together Govia, Thames, uh, Thames Link, a TfL and Barnet Council, and we've come forward with a cost of plan not only to introduce uh, step free access, but also the development. So thank you, Mike, for that. We've already rolled our sleeves up. Um, but most of all, it's not a public space. So what I can do if I'm re-elected, I will go back to not the train operating companies, Network Rail, who I have a very good relationship, and ask them to make that whole area smoke free. And what will you keep doing about it? Uh, 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 health is very important to our community. What I will do is I will go to a place and see what, what I, will, I will ask a survey for about 10, 15 people, so what they are, what they, how they feel uh, the smoke coming from here. So I will take from there, and uh, if the majority of the people say, oh, this is unhealthy, uh, then I will scrap and stop. Okay. Uh, uh, thank you. Yeah, no, um, I go through there every single day with my daughter. She's four. I pick her up from the nursery just up at County Cows. And we get the one at six down at the train station. And it is filthy and it is disgusting. And, and absolutely, uh, as your MP, I, I would also try and ensure that that area was, uh, was a public space so you can make it uh, smoke-free. Um, and, and also, you know, try and police it. If we had more uh, CSPOs on the streets, We'll be able to have more people out there to remind people of the law uh, once it is being made a public space. Uh, so, absolutely. So, combination of those two things, making it a public space and making sure that we have people on the streets and the station as well to support the law. Okay, um, final question. On the 25th of July 2016, the Palestinian Authority issued a statement at an Arab League conference that it intends to start legal action against the British government to overturn the Balfour Declaration. This year, of course, we are celebrating 100 years of the Balfour Declaration. The Labour Party manifesto states a Labour government will immediately recognize the state of Palestine. Do you concur with that? Do you agree with that? Will you consider supporting a recognition of a Palestinian state? But would you, in the first instance, require the Palestinian Authority to withdraw its threatened legal action and for the Palestinian Authority and the Arab League to make a public declaration that Israel has a right to exist and is the homeland of the Jewish people. We'll start with Mike. Oh, you would? Um, <laughs> it's a fair question. I'm a Zionist, I'm a proud Zionist, and therefore I believe in the right of national self-determination. We have to accept, if you, like me, believe in a two-state solution and at some point lasting peace in the Middle East between Palestine and Israel, that at some point the Palestinian state should have statehood. But that has got to come at the end of a process. What are the conditions? I would say at the end uh, that, that, that it's contingent on is free and fair elections. Also, for, you know, at the end of final states agreements, I would say then that is the time that it should come. Now, I'm very clear, any sort of apology for the Balfour Declaration is ridiculous. I'm also, I'm trying to the, 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 the other points that was made. It's very, very, it's very, very clear to me that a government would have to work with international partners. I personally don't believe that internet, the instant immediate recognition is the way forward here. I would lobby very, very hard, as together with colleagues in the Jewish Labour movement, we made sure that Labour Party policy on a two-state solution stayed the same in its published manifesto, contrary to some loony drafts that were floating around pre prior to the manifesto. Movement. We went in, we lobbied, we made sure that Labour Party had a consistent <coughs> policy on peace in the Middle East, which we are going to follow. So for me, it has to come. It, it's a, I'm afraid it's just you know, a natural consequence of the peace process, but it has to come with conditions. Great, thank you. Carmen? Uh, for once, I actually agree with Mike. Um, that definitely the two-state solution has to come from democratically elected governments 
And this is what I think we're all hoping to achieve. So one, one party just unilaterally announcing their statehood does not, does not meet that criteria. So um, I just don't, I don't want to re rehearse what uh, Mike just said. We do need to have the proper consultation, the proper sit down, proper peace negotiations. Okay. In the last uh, parliament, it was said on the floor of the House of Commons, it will be decided by Labour and government. The Honourable Member for Hendon should heed this. Since 2011, when the Leader of the Opposition, Ed Miliband, made Labour policy clear, Labour has supported Palestinian recognition of the United Nations. Nothing has changed. Corbyn is more passionate about it than ever before. There should be no talks with preconditions. There should be talks, and there will be talks. And what may be quite uncomfortable for some people here, I think President Trump will lead that. Uh, his predecessor said, I've heard this on very good authority by the Ambassador, he was not going to waste any time. President Obama was not going to waste any time because he knew it wouldn't happen. I think, particularly after the visit this week, Donald Trump may just take a lead. Uh, okay, Alistair. Thank you, yeah. Um, any attempts to, to, to delegitimize the State of Israel by having to apologize for the agreement is, is deeply politically motivated and undermines the, the entire principle of self-determination, uh, which I hold very dear as a liberal. Um, it's, uh, it, it, it's, it's just bonkers to, 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 uh, to, to apologize for something which is so historical and so important for, for a state to, to have formed. Um, I believe in the two-state solution. Uh, our party believes that as and when uh, it, it is um, appropriate that the Palestinian statehood should be recognized, it needs to be recognized because as a two-state solution, there needs to be two states. But it needs to be done on the provision that, uh, that Hamas uh, dropped Drop, drop their arms and recognize that the state of Israel must exist themselves. And if they don't do that, then we cannot continue uh, along the lines uh, until it is. And lastly, Richard? Uh, we believe, uh, as a Ukiba, as two state solution in 1967 borders, recognized by the United Nations. So, and now Hamas accepted that Israel is, is a state. So, in this case, two states should come together and then they resolve all of them. Okay, thank you very much, all of you. I want to thank you for coming along here tonight. I'm going to ask you now each to take 60 seconds, not more, to say why you feel you should be the next MP for our constituency. And with that, we'll wind down. Go ahead, start right across. Okay, so here in Hendon, we have a, a massive opportunity uh, to change the course of history. Uh, we, the Liberal Democrats, are the only party united in opposition to this UKIP-inspired hard Brexit. Um, the Tories are blinkered in their desire to crash out the single market, which will damage trade and jobs and destabilise our economy. The Corbyn's <laughs> Labour Party support of the Conservative Brexit in the House, um, as well as their desire to, um, to leave the single market and ramp up taxes, will make Britain a very un, uh, uncontested place to be. Um, here in Hendon, I've been active on local issues, leading from the libraries, as we mentioned before, <laughs> Uh, to protecting green spaces and speaking up for better transports. Um, my insight as a director of studies, as a teacher, um, gives me the sort of uh, experience that I recognise the realities of life that people face. Um, in this election, there are two clear choices on the future direction of this country. There is the conservative view of having a, a harder Brexit uh, and poor public services. Or there's my view. Labour will not take any votes from anyone, so if you want to vote for change, you have to vote Liberal Democrat. Thank you. Uh, uh, UKIP is the first party that uh, put Britain first. Our country is back, our jobs are back, our home is back, our children's future is bright. So uh, UKIP country before Bart. The country is first. People before Bart. People before politics. So what we are dealing is uh, we are creating Britain as a prosperous country and UK can develop. Thank you. We're certainly going to continue to work on the economy to keep it safe. Secondly, security <coughs> will be safe in the Conservatives' hands rather than in Diane Abbott's hands. Locally, I will work on air quality, I will work on school funding, I will work on the business rates. And finally, we will work on Brexit. It's a simple choice of this election. We've got Jeremy Corbyn, John McDonald, and once again, Diane Abbott in charge of our negotiations, or do we want the Conservative team under Theresa May? I know which one I would choose, so please vote Conservative. Thank you. Well, first I'll just start by reflecting on those last comments and say, well, given the absolute horlicks 
that Theresa May made of her social care policy, one of the biggest issues facing this country. I'm not entirely convinced in the, uh, in, in the, in the stability and the security of her ability to negotiate Brexit. But I'll be very clear about my values tonight and what I stand up for and the way that I would stand up for you as a community. A cu on issues like business grants, on issues like air quality, on issues like affordable housing, which unfortunately we've not really touched on tonight. On supporting education, as a father, it's really important to me that we have s smaller class sizes and properly funded schools. But I'd also want, I, and I think I do want to show leadership, and I've shown in the Labour Party and elsewhere how I've shown leadership. Sometimes there are really big issues where you need to listen to your electorate, and I'll be prepared to do, with, do that on a negotiated Brexit deal. I'm, I love Hendon. I know this area. My mum and my aunt, and my aunt all my family, lost my family, grew up in Edgware. My granddad did so much for Edgware United Synagogue. Sorry, mention the competition. <laughs> but if I, could, if, I could just, if I could just add very, very quickly, Excellent. very quickly. I wish there were another way, and I wish there were another electoral system. But there's only one party that can beat the Conservatives if you don't think you want to see a hard Brexit. And that if you want an MP that reflects your views, you need to vote for me. Thank, Thank you. you. Right. Well, this is history, actually. This is history in the making, and all of you have a chance to change it, to change the course of history. Do we really want to have a choice between two parties that have a lot of infighting amongst them? But do we want to have a third, a third choice, a choice where it's for the common good? Brexit, Brexit is a big issue, <coughs> and, we, and we, we want a referendum to make sure we know what we're getting into. The Green Party start, uh, stands for equality for all. We stand fiercely for social justice. We stand for issues that matter, poverty, pollution, health care, education. And I think it's about duty of politicians to plan further than the next election, to ask the difficult questions about the biggest challenges facing our country and our society. We have to ask questions such as, how are we going to change our economy so that power and money stops flowing from those with the least influence to those with the most influence in our society? Thank you. Okay. And just before we absolutely wrap up, some of you might have walked in here tonight somewhat ambiguous about which way you're inclined to vote or perhaps leaning to one side or another. I'm not going to ask you for a show of hands for which party you vote for. I'd just like a show of hands simply for anyone that may have been swayed away from their initial preference to another candidate. Ooh. Now that is interesting. Okay, there's a lot more hands than we had in the last past days. I can only now but conclude with thanking, first of all, our chairwoman, Lucy Jackson, for having coordinated tonight's evening. And to thank each of you for having joined us here again this evening. Good luck on Holy Day. Thank you all. Good night. Okay, thank you so much for joining us. This will be Occupy TV. Be good, Peace out.